something you say you have a good morning everyone uh, nice to see all of you early morning so uh, today we will have a, a couple of nice talk uh, uh, after the brief of uh, uh, some of the user committee members and a uh, little bit overview about the CNM users uh, and committees. Uh, my name is Nihar Pradhan. I am Associate Professor in Physics from Jackson State University, and I will be moderating this session. Um, so um, so uh, before starting the uh, our two nice talk, I just want to mention a few things about the, one of them is the CNM workshop uh, and APS CNM workshop, which are coming very soon. Um, the April 20th and 21st, which we have the nanomaterial interfaces. May 3rd, we have uh, uh, artificial and, and machine learning for modeling and characterization of nanoscale materials. Then May 4th, we'll have the nanomaterials and sustainability workshop at CNM. Then after that, APS CNM workshop, uh, which will be on uh, April 19th and 20th, uh, based on real-time analysis of synchrotron light source and nanoscale uh, research using AI and ML for APS users. May first and second, we will have the synchrotron-based autonomous scattering studies and synthesis and processing. Then May 4th and 5th, there is workshop on microelectronics. Um, then here probably most of the, you know about the user executive committee members. Uh, once the user members are, you know, that three or turns, um, probably you know the all uh, the faces. Uh, if some of you know, don't know, then probably here is the list. Then, uh, uh, I think Sophie is probably not here, and I will be the vice chair of the user uh, committee. Um, then we have uh, three uh, executive committee members, uh, outgoing committee members, Matthew Patani, Tobias Keep, and Jean Lok. Um, they were the outgoing user committee members, and thanks for their uh, input to the user facilities and committees. And uh, we have also uh, uh, new committee members, user committee members, uh, Okai Murthy, he's from Formilab, uh, a group leader materials for quantum devices at Formilab, and, and Priston Snee, who is the associate professor from the Department of Chemistry, University of Illinois at Chicago. And the uh, Professor Tao Zhu, who is the professor in chemistry and biochemistry from NIU. So welcome to these three new members. Um, then uh, we have uh, probably, uh, we can, uh, we have little early. If you have any question or anything, just let me know. Otherwise, uh, after that, we'll start uh two nice talk that will be coming one is the keynote uh, talk by professor itai cohen from cornell universities uh, i will introduce him then we will have another talk from professor diana berman from university of texas uh, any question anything that you may have Okay, so uh, let me introduce to, uh, first uh, our keynote speaker, Professor Itai Cohen, who is the professor in physics from Cornell University. Uh, he finished his PhD from University of Chicago uh, and BSc from BS from University of California, Los Angeles, and he published more than 110 uh, article journals. Uh, among the many award and honors, there are notable awards. Uh, he is the APS Fellow, uh, Finberg and Brangingski Fellow in 2012, 
and the Rossi and Max Baron visiting professor at the Weizmann Institute in 2021. Then uh, he was the Van der Waals visiting professor at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, his lab made uh, the smallest origami board that you can see probably besides his picture, okay, which holds the Guinness world record for the smallest walking robot. Probably we might see some of this uh, uh, story from his talk. Okay, so I will stop here sharing and allow the Professor Cohen to share his slides and we will hear from him. All right, uh, thank you, Nihar. Um, uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, talk to you a little bit about some of the work that we're uh, trying to do in this space of building microscopic robots. Um, and uh, the story really starts in this very famous lecture by uh, Richard Feynman uh, called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And in this lecture, uh, Feynman basically foresees uh, the miniaturization of uh, electronics and uh, mechanics. And you can tell that for the electronics portion, um, we're doing pretty well. Uh, 50 years of Moore's law have allowed us to reduce electronic components down to you know, the size that's about uh, you know, thickness of tens of atoms. And uh, you know, we can build uh, stronger, uh, much more powerful processors, all of that, I think, has been realized uh, in the past 50 years. But when it comes to the second prediction of miniaturizing machines, uh, there's a long and still uh, arduous road uh, ahead. And uh, the basic idea here is, can we do the same thing that we've done for electronics, but now thinking about machines at the micro scale and uh, beyond? Now, let me just say that in the um, realm of science fiction, this is a solved problem. Uh, in the Marvel Universe, we have uh, the Black Panther and Iron Man, both of whom have suits that uh, emerge from the collective behavior of uh, bajillions of nanorobots that self-assemble into these uh, suits. Um, if you uh, were a child uh, in the 70s, you may have seen the magic school bus, which is able to shrink uh, to sizes that are on the order of a blood cell. Um, uh, when I was growing up, the uh, Star Trek Next Generation encountered the Borg, which was an alien species that had uh, uh, little nanobots crawling around inside uh, you know, organisms to create uh, androids. Um, but the question that I want to ask today is, you know, yeah, but are there any real microscopic robots? And the answer is sort of. And what do I mean by that? Well, if I look um, today, uh, you might see uh, a whole bunch of systems. Some of them go under the uh, phrase active matter. So these, for example, are two devices um, that are uh, you know, microscopic in size. And these little particles are able to catalyze reactions, uh, in one case, uh, you know, generating uh, bubbles that drive the particle forward. In another case, maybe just doing some sort of catalysis reaction that uh, uh, puts, uh, gets a chemical gradient that drives the particle forward. Um, people have also figured out how to do things with magnetic uh, patterning. So in this particular case, this beautiful work by uh, just Hai Kui et al. Um, showed how to uh, essentially pattern little tiny uh, nanoscale magnetic domains. And then by applying external magnetic fields, you can manipulate these uh, little structures. And on the bottom, you're seeing a sort of magnetic worm that is able to inch itself across a surface um, as somebody uh, uh, changes the magnetic field. And the reason I say that these are sort of microscopic robots beca is because um, in order to operate them, you really need a very large infrastructure. So in the case of the magnetic systems, you'd need something like a hexapole magnet. Uh, you need a microscope and a camera to observe the state of the system, some sort of control interface to uh, observe the state and react or change the magnetic field in order to 
you know, alter the configuration of the robot. And the question that I want to ask today is, uh, what would it take uh, to essentially put all of that infrastructure on the robot at the micro scale, right? Can we make autonomous microscopic robots? Um, and that's the challenge that I'd like to put forth. Now, um, as I said before, uh, the brains of the robot, so we envision a robot as looking something like this. You would have a, a, the brains connected to some sort of actuators that serve as legs, maybe some photovoltaics for power. So the brains of the robot are actually the easy part. And that's because, again, 50 years of Moore's law. And so uh, today uh, at Cornell, my colleagues, uh, Paul McEwen and Al Molnar, have devised little tiny circuits that you can remove from the wafer. So let me introduce you to some of these. Um, so here's an example, a very, very simple circuit. Uh, this one measures the voltage uh, between these two pads. Let me try to see if I can get my laser pointer on. Um, between these two pads, this one over here and this one over here. And it does so using a bank of photovoltaics a little MOSFET transistor and an LED to blink out the intensity of the voltage difference. Now, these little devices have two tabs, one here and one here. These tabs are, they're similar to the kinds of tabs that you would have from a little model uh, set where you're sort of building, in this case, the James Webb telescope and you're uh, picking plastic parts out of there. And uh, the idea is that they can be broken off. And so then these can be floating around in solution, right? And so that allows you to take the electronics off of the silicon wafer. So what do these look like in comparison to the kinds of things that have already existed? Uh, so this is the University of Michigan Micromote. Uh, this is the UC Berkeley Smart Dust. So these are the kinds of chips that um, you would find maybe in like a pill that you would take and swallow and would go through your gut. And then these chips would be driving the cameras that take pictures of your gut um, as the pill is traversing uh, your intestines. And the devices that I'm talking about um, that we've been making here at Cornell are, are on the right. And the reason you don't see them um, is that uh, it turns out that on the penny, there are two Lincolns. So one Lincoln is located on the face of the penny, that's this one, but there's another Lincoln that's sitting inside the Lincoln Memorial. And if you blow up the Lincoln inside the Lincoln Memorial, that's the device that, that we're talking about. Now, of course, um, smaller doesn't necessarily mean better. Uh, these devices have a lot more uh, computational power. Uh, they are, um, you know, much bigger and have many more um, electronic elements on them. But smaller does, some, does have some advantages. So for example, uh, smaller means that they're cheaper. Uh, we can make a million on a wafer. That means that the cost per device is less than a penny. And uh, smaller also means that you can make many of them and that they're ubiquitous. And so someday you'll be looking down at your finger and that little speck of dust will actually be one of these devices, maybe taking a pH reading of your skin. And then when you shine your cell phone at it, it'll blink back that you need L'Oreal cream number seven uh, in order to pH balance your skin or something like that. All right, so again, the electronics is not uh, the hard part. That, that part we, we kind of know how to do. Um, the hard part of creating microscopic robots is the legs. And this is a material science problem that uh, has been very challenging and that uh, we're trying to make progress on here at Cornell. All right, so what's the problem? Um, the problem is that you cannot really design machines at the micro scale the same way that you would design them at the macro scale. So I can't take a jet engine and simply shrink it down. We don't have nano screws, we don't have nano screwdrivers. We don't have nano students to screw the nano screws with the nano screwdrivers. So all of that infrastructure is missing. We have to completely reimagine how we're going to build machines at this scale. And our lab has drawn tremendous inspiration 
from the kind of things that have been going on in the field of uh, origami. And in particular, um, we're thinking about these sort of printed robots. These are robots that are printed in 2D. You then slap a couple of batteries on, and after folding itself up into a three-dimensional shape, these robots can walk off the page. Now, admittedly, um, 80% of these robots that were made in uh, uh, Rob Wood and Eric Domain's labs at uh, Harvard and MIT, admittedly, 80% of these caught fire as they were walking off the page. Uh, but you get the idea. And, uh, and this is sort of the inspiration for really everything that, that I'm about to tell you. you know, and the question is, can we make origami machines at the micro scale? And in particular, can we steal all of this infrastructure that's been developed for building microchips and essentially use it to build a structure around a circuit, which would then be able to fold itself up and act as the three-dimensional body of a microscopic robot. Okay, that's the vision. And now what I wanna do is tell you a little bit about um, the progress that we're making towards achieving that vision. Okay, so if you're gonna make microscale origami, you need very thin paper. Um, and at Cornell, we're very lucky to have uh, one of the world's best nanofabrication facilities. And uh, it's a research uh, fab. And uh, we've learned how to make very thin sheets of paper. So in my colleagues, uh, lab in Paul McCune's lab, uh, they figured out how to take graphene, which is a single sheet of atoms, and how to texture it to make cuts in the graphene in order to get it to behave like this kirigami toy, this paper toy. Um, and here is a video of graphene being stretched very uh, similarly to the paper model. Right? And the way we're able to visualize a single sheet of atoms is by turning on the contrast, turns out graphene is a little bit absorbing of light. So if you turn on the contrast very high, you can image that single sheet of atoms. Um, we've also learned how to grow very thin sheets of paper using atomic layer deposition. This is work that was done uh, by the students Kyle, Tanner, and, and Barsh. And the idea here is that you evaporate, you basically spray paint one layer of atoms at a time and build up uh, a sheet that's five nanometers thick. Uh, in the top picture here, we've decorated these sheets with little pillars, little plastic pillars that allow you to image the sheet as it's being wrinkled um, uh, using this uh, probe over here. Um, at the bottom, I'm showing you a sheet that's been further textured so that um, we make cuts in it. And this sheet can expand and uh, essentially be stretched out uh, to adopt a uh, very you know, non-trivial three-dimensional sort of topologies. And then uh, when you remove, when you bring it back to its original place, it'll just come back to its flat state um, as printed. Okay, so these are examples of sheets that we now know how to make, very thin, atomically thin sheets. Um, and if we want to do something like, um, make an origami out of these, um, we have another problem, which is that um, unless, again, we can shrink our students down to the nanoscale, there's, there's no way to really fold them, right? You can't really take probes and do uh, nano folding. It, it's not really practical. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how to teach the sheet uh, to fold itself, kind of like this uh, inspirational video uh, by Mabona. And so uh, how do we do that? How do we get a sheet that we fabricate uh, to fold itself up? So here's uh, our version of this. This is an electrode that's holding, what you're seeing is an electrode over here that's holding on to a little ribbon. And uh, what's going on is that Mark is essentially turning the voltage knob on the electrode and this ribbon is coiling and uncoiling in response. Okay. So how does this work? Um, you take seven nanometers of platinum, 
you cover it on one side with an inert material like graphene or platinum uh, or titanium. You then fabricate your actuator and you put it in solution. If you apply a voltage onto the platinum, then ions in the solution can absorb onto the platinum surface. That creates a stress that is going to bend the film. If you apply the opposite voltage, you drive the ions off, and now the film returns to its original state. By putting rigid elements on the actuator, you can create folds between the rigid elements, and that's how you generate an origami shape. So that's the uh, way that it works. You can, you can do a little bit better um, by essentially applying a big enough voltage that instead of just absorbing onto the surface, the platinum uh, oxidizes. In that case, the oxygen forms a barrier so that when you uh, disconnect the power, uh, the oxygen atoms can't easily leave the film. When that happens, you can generate a hysteresis in the curvature as a function of voltage. And what you can create are shape memory materials. And so uh, in this particular case, you have to apply a negative voltage in order to drive the oxygen atoms out. And so everywhere between here, where you apply the positive 1.3 volts or whatever it is, all the way down to here, where you start applying negative voltages, this uh, sheet will maintain its configuration. And so that allows us to apply a voltage in order to fold up uh, the hinges. You can remove the electrode, hinges stay folded, or you apply the opposite voltage to uh, bring the hinges back to their flat state. You remove the electrode, and now the system stays in the flat state. Okay? So this allows us to create shape memory materials. Um, why uh, is this important? So the devices that we can create, this is a plot of the maximum change of curvature as a function of the actuation voltage. And the kinds of things that you might be used to are you know, piezoelectric ceramics. Those are uh, found right here. So you need large voltages, hundreds of volts, in order to get uh, you know, fairly moderate changes in, in the curvature of these devices. Um, and the devices that we're talking about here are uh, these up here in red. Okay, these are the shape memory uh, actuators. And um, the reason this is important is that, you know, if you want to build a macro scale robot, you need things that can bend on the macro scale. So then it's sufficient to use the materials that have been developed uh, over here in this regime. If you want to build milli scale robots, uh, then you'd want to use devices uh, like the ones that you see over here. But if you want to build a microscopic robot, you need to be able to bend on a radius scale that's smaller than a micron. And that's because that scale determines the smallest feature size of your robot. And so you want to get that small in order to be able to build a robot that still you know, functions at this micro scale. All right, so um, we've been able to achieve radii of curvature that are submicron at voltages that are uh, about a volt, which is what you need if you want to integrate with electronic circuits eventually. OK, so using these uh, kind of uh, systems, um, we've made a hexagonal fold, a Mira Ori. And this is the world's uh, smallest uh, folding uh, bird. Uh, so these devices are, have a footprint which is on the scale of about a hair's diameter. So if you pluck a hair from your head, I'm not going to do it, I'm losing my hair, but if you pluck one from yours and you look head on and you look at the footprint of that hair, uh, then this is the scale of, of the devices that we're talking about. And they are simply gorgeous. So what you're seeing here in bright yellow uh, is a false colored SEM. And in bright yellow is the thin, 10 nanometer thin actuator. The dark yellow patterns here or shapes are silicon dioxide panels that restrict the bending to occur between them. Right? And this is the Mira Ori uh, pattern that I showed you. And this is uh, the bird pattern that I showed you. Here's a stage that we uh, developed that can move up and down. And uh, this 
uh, Bird was uh, um, uh, on the cover of Science Robotics here, and uh, we were quite proud of that. But despite the uh, amazing achievement here, there's still something that's you know not quite right, which is that this bird has this little I don't know ribbon that's that's hanging out from its bum, and we'd like to get rid of that ribbon. Um, we want this thing to be uh, functioning on its own. Uh, here, you're applying the voltage externally with the probes in order to get these devices to fold up. All right, so how do we do that? Um, well, we can take photovoltaics and attach them to our actuators. So here is an example of a device that we fabricated in the clean room. You take a photovoltaic here and you attach it to one of the actuators. And uh, what you can do then is if you shine light on the photovoltaic, that should allow you to uh, actuate. And indeed, uh, here's our first ever video of this happening. So this is our hello world. Uh, we shine light over here and the actuator uh, moves. It's a little bit hard to see. There we go again. So here's the little arm moving back and forth. And this is our hello world. All right, so now uh, you get uh, very excited. You, you make a much more complicated robot with a photovoltaic for the front legs and another photovoltaic for the back legs. Uh, you make bajillions of them. You make sure that you put the pads on to restrict the bending in between the pads so that you can control the motion of the arms. And, uh, and then you get this. So this uh, one we call Brobot. He is flexing his muscles, uh, belongs on a beach somewhere. Um, and what's happening is that we're shining light on the front photovoltaics right around here. And then Brobot is, is flexing. Now, of course, uh, Brobot has a bunch of defects. Um, all that chest hair, uh, that really shouldn't be there. That's the technical term for that is schmutz. Uh, we've obviously ripped the back legs off of Brobot, but you get the idea of, of the vision here. And if you work hard, as Mark did, to really um, get all of these issues under control, uh, then you end up with this robot. This is a 40 micron by 70 micron by two micron robot. It is so small that particles nearby are jostling uh, in a Brownian fashion. Okay? These are being jostled by the fluid molecules that the robots are located in. And by shining light on the front and back photovoltaics in an alternating fashion, you can drive the front legs and the back legs to actuate. And this robot folds itself up and walks off the page. And this is the robot that holds the record um, for the world's smallest walking robot. Now, as amazing as this robot is, it also has a, a problem, which is that it's effectively a marionette. Right? It has strings that are pulling the different limbs. And uh, in our case, those strings are really lasers that are um, being aimed at the photovoltaics, but they're strings nonetheless. And the question is, how do we get rid of those strings to get the system to be autonomous? To do that, we've partnered with XFAB, which is a commercial foundry. XFAB, we send it a circuit. It fabricates the transistors, capacitors, resistors, photovoltaics, et cetera. And then what we do is the post-processing, the header integration to create the body of the robot around those circuits. And so uh, this is the team that was responsible for um, making the brains of these robots. Uh, Al Molnar in our electrical engineering department was the lead and uh, really the heavy lifting was done by Alejandro and Michael Reynolds. Um, and the idea here is that uh, they uh, designed the circuit and had XFAB fabricated. And this is what the silicon brains look like when they come back from XFAB on, on an eight inch wafer. So these are what the brains look like close up. Uh, you essentially have photovoltaics to power both the circuit, which are the bottom ones, and the actuators, which is the big ones. And in this particular case, the circuit, the CMOS circuit, which acts as the brain, uh, is essentially a clock circuit. So we call it clock bot. It emits a pulse every uh, cycle. And depending on which pin you connect to, you can uh, 
get that pulse with different phase delays. And then there's another set of pins that allows you to pick the frequency with which you get these pulses. And so uh, we can essentially connect legs to the pins that we want and pick the frequency that we want. And uh, then the hard work starts. This is where Michael did a lot of the heavy lifting. So Michael figured out um, how to essentially combine 13 lithographic layers um, through a lot of hard work and uh, many tools in our clean room. And uh, in doing so, he was able to figure out how to connect these circuits and eventually generate legs on these robots in order to get them uh, to locomote. So once you've done all of that fabrication, you need to release the robots. And so you uh, etch out the insulator layer that all of this is built on. And these robots then uh, float to the surface. You can pick them up uh, and put them on the substrate that you want to uh, get them to walk on. So, so let me introduce you to some of these robots. Um, this one is a clock circuit that's attached to a leg on the right and a leg on the left. Um, these are uh, essentially grounded grounds for the circuit. And uh, this robot works by moving its legs closer to or farther away from the center of mass. Because there's weight pulling down on this, gravity's pulling down on this, if you're closer to the center of mass, there's more force on this leg. That means that the friction coefficient is higher. So if this leg actuates, the robot will move to the right. And so that's kind of what's happening in this Lego model that's um, moving on this very slick uh, table. Um, you're essentially moving the legs closer to or farther from the center of mass, and the robot will inch itself uh, to the right. And here is Purcellbot um, doing exactly the same thing. And now there are no lasers. We just place these robots in light, and they will move on their own. And this is all at a scale of about 100 microns, again, about the footprint of a Harris diameter. Uh, we can do other things. Uh, many insects, like ants, uh, use different locomotory gates to move across surfaces. Uh, in the case of a hexapod, um, you can change the timing between the legs to achieve these different gates. Uh, and we can do the same thing here on our robots. I'll show you one gate. Uh, this is the one where the uh, called a tripod gate, where all the legs labeled one move at the same time, and all the legs labeled two move at the same time. And that gives you a tripod on one side, alternating with the tripod on the other. Here is Antbot, again, uh, just being placed in light and moving across our surface uh, using this kind of tripod gate. You can see that these three legs, one, two, and three, all go at the same time, alternating with the other three legs. Um, an antbot uh, prior to uh, being released was, uh, again, on the cover of Science Robotics. This is what it looks like. Here's the circuit. And these are the six legs that um, are uh, generating the locomotion. Um, we can also put a little optical receiver on our circuits. Um, and that allows us to send commands to these robots. In this particular case, we're going to send a shift command. So we send in a bunch of ones and zeros that tell the robot to change the frequency of locomotion from two to four hertz. And so because this robot receives commands, we call it dogbot. So here's dogbot in real time moving across our surface. Now we're going to change. We're going to give it a shift command and change the frequency from two hertz to four. And uh, all of a sudden, Dogbot walks at twice the speed across our surface. And in the same way that the uh, Marvel universe has metastasized into all sorts of different superheroes, uh, our little Cornell Microsystems universe has also metastasized into lots of little uh, tiny uh, um, uh, projects. Or not, yeah, I guess they are microscopic, so they are tiny. Um, big in scale uh, in terms of uh, person power, but tiny in scale in terms of the actual machines produced. We are generating um, little sensors that can be implanted inside biological organisms. In this case, little sensor that can be implanted inside the brain 
and reads out the voltage uh, of the neurons firing. We have developed artificial cilia. Um, the micro robots I told you about, we're also developing robotic metamaterial surfaces, uh, little bubblers that can bubble their way through materials and uh, invisible ID tags. And I'm not gonna take you through in a very detailed fashion through any of this, but I'll just sort of very briefly glance through um, what's going on. So uh, in this particular case, uh, we're developing cilia. These are little tiny hairs that can drive fluid flow. So here are the cilia pumping little colloidal particles up. And the nice thing about these cilia is that once you can pump in one direction, um, you can actually uh, generate any kind of flow that you want by essentially organizing these cilia in different arrays. So in this particular case, we're uh, orienting them in a square array. And by actuating uh, different cilia in these arrays, we can, for example, get fluid to come in from above and below and out to the sides that generates an extensional flow. Or if we activate all the outer ones, like in C, then you end up getting fluid pulled in from the third dimension and going out in the plane. You can transport fluid like in D or turn it like in E. And that allows you to create really an array that can generate arbitrary flow patterns, just depending on which cilia uh, arrays we actuate in this matrix. We have been learning how to actuate in air. This is another beautiful materials problem. Again, using uh, the platinum system, we've shown that we can use gases in order to trigger the curvature, the bending of these uh, actuators. And here we've generated chemical actuators with the highest curvatures of any other system that has been generated. And by figuring out the different states along the way, as oxygen and hydrogen are replacing one another on the platinum surface, we're able to do this in a very rapid state, uh, in a very rapid manner. So the actuation here from this H covered state to the clean state, which is where we operate around, happens on the scale, on the sub-second time scale. Okay, again, a major um, leap forward for chemical actuators. We're designing devices that can be uh, used as uh, little probes inside the body. So this is an example of a probe that would be, that's currently available that uses piezos. Uh, it's about uh, half a centimeter uh, wide in its diameter. And this is the kind of thing that you would use uh, to go up uh, a urethra in order to probe some, uh, the prostate gland, for example. And so our question is, can we make this even smaller? And so what we're thinking about are taking little optical fibers that can carry electric circuits as well as optical um, uh, channels and attach them to the robotic elements that I've shown you. Um, and the main problem here is that if you want to go inside the body and actuate inside the body, uh, you can't do it with platinum. And the reason is that uh, platinum, uh, the thing that's driving the platinum actuation is this oxidized region near the surface of the platinum. And as you um, uh, go uh, and make this actuator thicker, that oxidized region does not increase. And so you end up losing the energy that's driving the bending. That ends up going as one over the thickness. And so as you make the film thicker, you make it stronger, but it also bends much less. You can solve this problem by working with palladium and here, palladium is a bulk electrochemical actuator, which means that if you apply a voltage to the palladium, hydrogen now gets absorbed into the bulk of the palladium. And that means that you can make your actuator much thicker and still retain uh, a high energy density, okay? Because the entire palladium region is being used or is allowing you to uh, bend your, your film, okay? So you're able to maintain that radius of curvature even as your film grows. And that allows us to make a device which operates at very low actuation voltages, very high energy densities, and at uh, a very small radii. And that's what this red data here is showing you. Um, these devices you can put inside of a gel that is comparable to the stiffness of the human brain, for example, and it's able to actuate 
and drag that gel or rip through that gel uh, without any problems. And this is our first example of one of these devices attached to a fiber. And again, it's a very simple hello world, but the idea is that this fiber is carrying electrical wires that attach to a robotic element at the bottom. And as I play this video, please pay attention to the little arms at the end here. Oops, I guess this video won't play. Let me see if I can. Um, enter options. Uh, so if I play this video and you look over here, you can see these little tiny actuator elements bending back and forth. This is our hello world now for the um, uh, fiber attached to the machine. We've worked on metamaterial robots, which can be printed in 2D and actuated in 3D. Um, here again, uh, we use the palladium because these structures are very heavy. Um, you can actuate the inside or the outside to generate different shapes and even locomotory patterns. We've built little tiny robotic arms that can uh, have different uh, motions, including swinging, lifting, twisting, and grasping. So here are some of the motions of the arms and uh, the various uh, types of behaviors that we can achieve when all of these uh, actuation uh, mechanisms are brought into play. So um, this is, of course, the very beginnings of our uh, journey into the microscale world, we call it phase one. And there are many other things that uh, are coming down the pipe as we learn to build these robots and interface them with electronics that, are more, that have more and more sophistication. So what would this technology enable at this 100 micron scale? Well, pretty much everything that you can imagine doing at the macro scale you can imagine doing at the micro scale as well. At the macro scale, robots sweep our floors. Could we use these tiny robots to sweep surfaces of tissues that we're trying to build, carry cargo into locations that are hard to reach, make microsurgical tools that are smaller by an order of magnitude from the ones that are currently available, and allow us to explore this micro scale world in a way that really we couldn't do with just top down optics? So let me finish by saying that uh, the research here that I've shown you is really the um, combined efforts of many collaborators across the Cornell campus, both students, postdocs, and faculty. And I'll end by um, uh, showing you this, uh, you know, reviewing the various papers that we've published on this. And I'll also say that um, we're in search of uh, postdocs to continue on this work, adventurous postdocs to continue on this work, and so if you're interested, uh, please uh, contact me and let me know. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Cohen. It's very interesting talk. We have about seven minutes for question and discussion. I can't hear anything on my end. So uh, if you're able to either read the chat or uh, translate for me, that would be great. I don't see any question in the chat. So Please enter your questions in the Q&A. Oh, Q&A, okay. Uh, I have not seen any question in Q&A. Nothing yet. Yeah, so no, let me ask one of the questions that how small uh, can these robots would have like a uh, as you mentioned probably, uh, which can be gone through in Denstein and image some of the stuff or in the brain. So how small it will be so that it will be more effective to use in the human brain or in a living cell? Yeah, I mean, so the, the size again, depends on how small you can build the building blocks, the elements. Uh, in the case of the uh, materials that, that we've developed so far, we can get bending radii of about a micron. So that, that tells you that any robot that you build is going to be on the order of a micron or bigger. And uh, that turns out to be quite useful for, for lots of things. Um, so, uh, you know, in the brain, if you can get uh, below a scale of 100 microns, 
then you can start to put probes in that do much less damage than sort of the millimeter scale probes that are currently jabbed into brains uh, in order to uh, take electronic readings of the neurons. Um, in the case of, uh, you know, probes that we're uh, using to either conduct surgeries or, uh, you know, put up arteries and uh, other various channels that are in the body. Uh, usually the smaller the probe, the less invasive the surgery, the easier it is to conduct the, the measurements. Okay. So there are a few questions in Q&A. I will read one um, by one. How does nonlinearity mechanical response from the fluid affect the performance of these robots? Yeah, I mean, so I should say these robots um, at the moment are in, uh, in water, okay, or in some PS buffered water. Actually, they, they can function at arbitrary pHs. They're basically very robust in that way. Um, but they need ions from solution in order to function. And uh, they're, so they're in, because of their small scale, most of the fluid mechanics is Stokes flow, which is linear. So there's no real nonlinearity. If you start building swarms of these robots, thinking about much larger scales, then you have the capacity to start generating length scales for the flows that become uh, inertial. And then you have, uh, you could have some nonlinearities um, happening there. Um, we are building robots that function in air too. Uh, these robots carry the charges internally and can function in any environment, oil, water, air, whatever. And those robots um, will have to contend with uh, some of the nonlinear aspects of uh, fluid flows associated with aerodynamic flight, for example. Um, see a couple of other questions about which aspect of these robots is nanoscale. Um, the, all of the um, hinges, all of the uh, devices that actuate are submicron. And so that's, that's where the nanoscale part comes into these robots. Um, if you want to get smaller, you may be able to go a little bit smaller by making actuators out of single sheets of atoms. So I think that would be the, the absolute limit. And anything smaller than that, um, you're really now into the realm of proteins as machines. Um, and in that situation, I think the best that we're going to be able to do is to hijack the machinery of biology in order to uh, create smaller you know, devices that can, that can function on, on the nanoscale, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of controlling the robot pathways, um, yes, so you can build detectors on these robots and we're working on that. These detectors could allow the robot to follow light gradients. So if you put in uh, a light gradient, the robot should be able to go towards the light, away from the light or straddle. Um, we're doing the same thing with chemical detection and heat detection. All of these are uh, technologies that are coming down the pipe. And uh, oxidation uh, and working lifetime. So there's a couple of things here. Um, you know, the, the lifetime of the actuators sort of depends on how much you're reorganizing the atoms that are making up the actuator. Now, in the case of the platinum actuator, if we simply adsorb ions to the surface, you're not doing much to the platinum. And in that case, um, everything is actually pretty robust. You can actuate those things many, many times. And the reason is that, you know, when you have such thin films, you don't generate much strain. So if you imagine trying to bend the beam, okay, that beam, the top of the beam has to expand and the bottom of the beam has to contract in order for the beam to bend. But there's one plane in the middle of the beam where it neither expands nor contracts. Right? And so if your film is thin enough that it's really just operating near that zero strain limit, then you don't get much strain for your film, even though you're creating very large radii, very small radii of curvature. And so as long as you're not doing much to disrupt the, uh, the structure of the platinum, these things will actuate um, for very long times, many, many thousands of cycles, no problem. Now, when you start making um, the oxidation or the hydration of the palladium, for example, or oxidation of the platinum, 
then you're disorganizing the structures. And now it's a real materials problem to figure out how to make an actuator that is um, probably less crystalline, less plastic, more like a metallic glass that is, that is very strong, elastic, but also more brittle. And so you have this trade-off that you're constantly trying to figure out, depending on your engineering purpose, as to whether to make these actuators robust in terms of you know, how uh, plastically they can be formed and so the whole thing stays intact, or hard and rigid, um, much more elastic, but now if you, you know, push it too far, it'll shatter, it'll become brittle. And so again, it depends on the engineering purpose, which way you want to go with that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Professor Cohen, uh, for your nice, uh, interesting talk. And we can move to our second and last talk for today's session. Okay, uh, so Diana, if you can share your presentation while I'm introducing you. Okay. Hello, so, can you see my presentation? Yes. Uh, okay, so our second talk is Professor Diana Berman, who is the Research Director, Crystalline Material Corning Incorporated. And uh, she will be talking about the design of functional microcomponent nanoporous metal oxides and their heterostructure using polymer template. So she did uh, her PhD and MS in physics from North Carolina State University, BSc from Applied Physics and Mathematics from Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. And uh, she achieved several honors and award among them some of the uh, notable awards are Ralph E. Poe Junior Faculty Enhancement Award, uh, Tech Connect National Innovation Award in 2017 for a direct method to grow single and multi-layer graphene on insulating substrate at upper scale in one minute technology. And she also received outstanding postdoctoral performance award from Argonne National Laboratory. So Diana, go ahead. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. It's always a pleasure for me to join uh, the C CNM uh, APS meetings because, as many of you may know, I did my postdoctoral studies at uh, Argonne National Lab at CNM, and that's why, like, I have like my own connection to the uh, CNM, and really enjoy returning back to any of the conferences. Today, I will talk about the topic, this whole research idea area that originated when I've been moving from Oregon and when I started my independent career at the University of North Texas as assistant professor six years ago. So now I just got my associate professor degree. Um, not degree, <laughs> associate professor position, but in that uh, topic, we specifically were interested in the designing uh, different ceramic heterostructures that would allow us to incorporate the systems in var various applications. And uh, here you can see some examples of the areas that we've been working with, specifically looking at the use of these nanopore ceramics for the anti-reflective coatings, for the catalysis, for the water filtration, for lithography, for the scaffolds. And today I will be highlighting some of those uh, that I've been working on. The whole idea coming from the concept that we want to design uh, nanoporous materials, and uh, there are like different approaches for designing these materials, and definitely many of them have their own uh, advantages. So we have like chemical routes, vacuum-based routes, uh, lithographic approaches, but for most of these techniques, they really suffer from the limitations as oftentimes they work only for single component materials, single component coatings. They show slow deposition process, or uh, if we're using some etching results, they don't allow to gain the control on the design of the materials as we wish for. 
And with all of them, we really have the problem of creating some more advanced structures with the gradient, for example, porosity or incorporation of the different multi-component structures and sites. Having this in mind, uh, we came to this process that is called sequential infiltration synthesis, and it also originated from Argonne National Lab when uh, Seth Darling and Jeff Ilum uh, first invented this whole concept of using the polymer templates for the sequential infiltration synthesis of the new advanced structures. In this concept, we pretty much use the block of polymer templates that have polar and non-polar domains. PMMA in this case is the polar domain, polystyrene is non-polar. Upon, upon exposure to the uh, different metals uh, oxide precursors, such as, for example, in this case, TMA, trimethyl aluminum, um, due to the reactivity of the trimethyl aluminum with the polar domains, it has the tendency to infiltrate to in only the polar parts of the polymers, while leaving non-polar parts uh, untouched and free of any precursors. With doing this uh, several cycles and creating this full infiltration of the polar domains, after the re removal of the polymer, we can create the ceramic structure that completely replicate the geometry of the initial polymer template. So we took this approach. We started with our structure of the polar and non-polar systems. In this case, we have red as our polar structure and gray as non-polar matrix. We infiltrated these to create this more complex geometries of the metal oxide structures. And after burning away the polymer, we have complete replicate of the initial structure. So you can see here the green one. In this case, we can get, for example, alumina as replicating the initial structure of the polymer template. With this process using the SAS, we can get the fast processing and specifically design, of, for example, 15 nanometer thick films within five cycles of the sequential infiltration synthesis can be done pretty quickly in comparison for the 15 nanometers uh, of thick films using the LD process, it would require around like 500 cycles. Um, with the approach, it also allows to very precisely control the porosity of the resulting material since we have now possibility for manipulating the structure of our materials by changing the relative polar non-polar domain concentration, the number of cycles, changing the ordering of the materials, and thus we can preserve the quality of the printed patterns. And then our conformal porous coatings can be deposited on different substrates and different nanoscale features and different geometries. So allowing very easy and very scalable process for coating the materials of the interest. So for now, like I've been mostly talking about the regular SAS as it originated about like 10 years ago. The regular SAS process itself also had some limitations. The thickness of the nanoporous ceramic films was limited to only 40, 50 nanometers, which is defined by the diffusion depth of the metal oxide precursor. So you can see here, since we need the TMA to infiltrate the PMMA domains, usually it was happening only within this very thin layer. It wasn't really compatible with water sensitive materials because in the repeated cycles, we needed the exposure to the TMA and then to water vapors to get this complete conversion and infiltration of the alumina inside the PMMA structure. And because of this, it also showed that it was successful for infiltration of alumina, but trying to transition from alumina to some other materials was really challenging. So we took that initial setup as the thought and how we can use it for creating unlimited opportunities for the design of more advanced materials and more advanced non-structures in the materials. Today, I'm going to stop on the three different subtopics that would be describing the recent uh, 
uh, advances that we got in the design of this functional syndromic uh, uh, heterostructures. And I will be highlighting some representative examples. So I will start with the first one, specifically looking at how we can improve the infiltration efficiency of the materials to overcome the limit of 50 nanometer thickness of the films and to create more complex geometries in the systems. And for this, we took the concept about modifying our block copolymers using the swelling approach. In the swelling approach, pretty much again, we have the block copolymers that have both polar and non-polar domains. We're exposing them to swelling specific uh, system swelling specific agents, such as in case of, for example, polystyrene, uh, polyvinyl pyridine, we have selectivity of uh, ethanol to swell only PVP domains. Upon the swelling, we're in creating the expansion of the structure. And once the sphalic agent is removed, that leaves the intrinsic additional porosity inside the structure. With this one, what we create much creating, we're starting with the initial polymer structure, we're exposing it to the swelling that creates the small channels for additional porosity and also expands the polymer. With the additional, with the existence of the additional channels, now we don't have any limitation on the infiltration depths. Pretty much like any thickness of the polymer can be infiltrated with the metal oxide precursors. And because this uh, porosity, these additional channels of the porosity are very small, they are not like really affecting much the final configuration of the materials. They just allowing to create this thick complex structures. With this, we've been able to significantly improve the thickness of our films. We've been able to get like just as freestanding membranes up to 10 micron thick metal oxides. Uh, or if we incorporate this in the larger matrix, we can create like millimeter or even like up to centimeter thick, uh, thick materials. They show really high porosity with the size of the pores ranging from 20 to 30 nanometers. They show very high interconnectivity of this porosity and demonstrate much faster growth of organic phases as compared to the unswelled block copolymers. And I'll show you in the second part of the talk, they also allowed us to significantly increase the number of the metal oxides that we can incorporate in our structures. So with this one, we've been focusing on really understanding what is happening in our polymer domains upon uh, different processes, upon swelling and upon infiltration and how it's modifying the polymers, how we can control this process to create more advanced systems. So here, just one of the example of the systems, when we started with the block polymer, we did the swelling of the block polymers to increase the excess of the materials for the infiltration. Then we did the infiltration of the materials. And you can see here that structure pretty much remains the same. And then after complete removal of the polymer template, we got the structures made from the metal oxides. And pretty much the swelling just resulted in the formation of these very small pores, additional nanoscale pores that now exist inside the polar domains of the polymer. Why it is needed? Uh, this whole concept originated now like towards my interest in the uh, tribological aspects of interactions of the materials with the different media, we try to really look at the solutions of how we can increase the accessibility of our materials, how we can increase their interfaces that would be possible to uh, to be involved in different uh, reactions. And in this case, when we created this porosity, we started to look how accessible uh, the porosity is, how accessible interfaces to the different exposures of the different solvents, of the different gases, so that we can increase their surface reactivity and we can increase their 
uh, sensitivity to the environments. Here, one of the examples of the sensitivity of the systems to the liquid environments. And here we're showing that immersing in water, immersing in acetone gives us up to 98% per of the all available porosity being accessible to the liquids. So addition of these small nanoscale channels also helped to really make this material fully available for any re reactive species. And that is like very unique because if you would use some traditional approaches for the design of nanoporous materials, usually they don't really show this type of the interconnectivity. For example, with lithography, you have only vertical access to the materials with some of the uh, soil gel cell uh, deposition, you don't really have access to the bottom part of your coating, only to the top part. So here it really shows the benefits of creating this accessibility in the materials. Where it really mattered, it helped us to modify our system and to create the sensing materials based on the nanoporous approaches. And here are the example of the measurements that you can see for the comparison of the humidity sensing when we have just pure bulk alumina films. They don't really show much sensitivity to the water molecules, though usually bulk material, bulk alumina could be used in some kind of sensors, water sensors. Whenever we create this nanoporous alumina because of the such high accessibility to the material, such high uh, uh, interconnectivity of the pores, we have this maximized access, maximized interfaces available to react with water and to create these uh, uh, to create these reactions uh, with the uh, defining the sensitivity levels for the humidity. So with this materials, with this alumina, we've been able to detect very like small changes in the coverage of the materials with the water molecules and how this can be used to maximize the effectiveness of materials as sensors. With this one, um, this was pretty much just quick highlight of what was done like a while ago, but I wanted to focus more on how this could be used for really creating the complex multi-component het structure that were the primary interest for us uh, in developing. So can we use this swelling since it shows like such an interesting behavior and it shows like an increase in the effectiveness of the materials? Can we now use the swelling for additional infiltration control and expand our library of the possible metal oxides uh, that could be designed using the process to some new materials and new systems. And with this one, let me show you some of the recent work that we've been focusing on uh, in collaboration with CNM on using the swelling for creating some new uh, SIS designed materials. And in this case, it enabled us actually to design zinc oxide uh, systems, zinc oxide and of course zinc oxide films. Previously, zinc oxide SIS was possible only after seeding the block of polymers with aluminous, uh, with alumina. SAS process, but with the introduction of the swelling step, we significantly increasing the number of the reactive sites in the polymers and they becoming enough for activating the deposition and infiltration of the zinc oxide precursor. Here you can see the summary of this whole concept that we've been using. So we start again with the block polymer template, BCP template. We're going then to the uh, swelling step, just putting this BCP template in ethanol. With ethanol, as you remember, we're expanding the polymers. We're creating this additional channels for the uh, porosity that would allow us to infiltrate more efficiently the metal uh, oxide precursor. And then what we're doing that after swelling, after introduction of the porosity, we exposing now our templates to zinc oxide process. 
that allows to infiltrate polar domains with SAS pro, uh, with zinc oxide. And after the polymer removal, we have only zinc oxide and the porous zinc oxide structures left on the surface. These materials also show the changes in the uh, hydrophilicity of the surfaces. So if initially our block of polymer shows the contact angle almost 90 degrees with the swelling, we're significantly improving the reactivity of the material to the zinc oxide uh, precursors, which are polar. So you can see here improvement in the hydrophilicity of the surfaces that allows, uh, that allows us to improve the infiltration efficiency. And then upon the removal, we're just receiving pretty typical for zinc oxide uh, contact angle, wetting contact angle of the surfaces. With these, we have now very precise control of how thick polymer films we want to create and also how large porosity we want to create in our systems. Why it is really important? Because with that one, we can manipulate our access to the materials even further. Um, you can see here that the accessibility of this porosity is also pretty high level. The higher porosity we have, the more porosity is accessible. The lower porosity, we have lowering in the access because some of the porosity becomes blocked for the water penetration, as in this case. These created zinc oxide structures having some degree of the crystallinity, and um, they pretty much replicating the bulk structure. So because of this, we expect them to be pretty reactive for uh, sensitivity and the absorption of the different uh, reduction gases. So if I look now at zinc oxide system, what was the major goal for making this interesting uh, materials is that zinc oxide uh, materials are the basic components for many sensing systems. So if we can create this very highly accessible porous structures with very precise control of how much porosity we have, where exactly it is located, what is the design of the porosity, what is the composition of our system, we can also create very interesting sensing systems that can be incorporated in all the different geometries that can be easily printed on all the different substrates. The benefit of this whole process using the SIS that it requires very low mild temperatures for the processing. And we usually do the deposition below 100 degrees C, just exposing our surfaces to 90 degrees C, which is also compatible with many polymeric substrates. With this one, um, using the concept, we try to understand how these zinc oxide SIS uh, produced materials are demonstrating their functionality in terms of sensing the reduction gases. And we started by designing the system that would be tested for ethanol sensing. For this, we have specific uh, chamber for measuring the sensitivity of the materials where we're combining the QCM quartz crystal microbalance measurements with the electrical conductivity monitoring of the systems. And you can see now here that we're introducing the gases using uh, here, you can see the changes in the pressure of the gases. At the same time, it is affecting the resistance of the materials as by reduction, we are increasing the conductivity paths for the uh, electrical conductivity of the zinc oxide structures. And at the same time, we're measuring using the QCM how much we exactly absorb of the ethanol molecules on the surface of the QCM and on the surface of the sensors. If you're familiar with a uh, sensing mechanism, that's pretty much the major concept. If not, we can discuss this further if there are some questions afterwards.
But what we specifically demonstrated that if all the zinc oxide systems that are traditionally used for the sensing, they usually rely on the high temperature detection because we need high temperature to activate the reduction of zinc oxide and depletion of the oxide layer on the surface of the zinc uh, in order to improve the conductivity of the materials. Due to the high sensitivity and high content of the OH groups on our zinc oxide uh, films, we demonstrated that they are sensitive to the ethanol even at room temperature. So this is the comparison. Bulk zinc oxide doesn't show any changes at 25 degrees C versus 90 degrees C because it just doesn't have enough OH groups to facilitate the attachment of ethanol molecules and making the materials more conductive. Meanwhile, the materials that are designed using the polymer templates, they said 25-25, just having a little lower porosity than 75-25, these two materials, they demonstrating very high sensitivity to the gases. And with this one, they pretty much able to detect subonolayer changes in the coverage of the ethanol molecules, thus showing like very, very high sensitivity to any uh, percentages or like any partial pressures of ethanol present in the atmosphere. So absorption of ethanol is highly dependent on this availability of surface area or porosity because our materials, again, they're like very highly porous. They like have all the accessibility, all the pores are very interconnected and accessible. Because of this, we've been able to detect even smallest changes in the absorption of the ethanol molecules in such system, even at room temperature. And temperature, yes, it affects the sensitivity of the nanoporous structures. We definitely see the increase in the detection rates when we're transitioning from 25 to 90 degrees C, but that was already enough. Even at 25 degrees C, we've been able to really detect the smallest changes in the materials coverage. And increased thickness of the coatings also increased the response of the systems. Now, because we have such a precise control over what we can develop, we can use different thickness of the polymers. We can use different relative concentration of the polar and non-polar domains. And as a result, we can now create the sensors on any possible substrate and have them already been working at room temperature. Um, that was uh, pretty much uh, supported by the DFT studies demonstrating that the reactivity of the SIS design zinc oxide structures is also facilitated by the high number of OH groups that are sitting on their surface. And this is the consequence of having the polymer template initially prior to the deposition and also having the swelling step that additionally improves the functionality of the structures. So now I want to show the third part of my talk and making the structures even more advanced. So in the first two parts of the talk, we learned that swelling is like really nice approach for improving the accessibility of the porosity, for improving the thickness of the materials and for improving the library of the materials that can be incorporated inside the structure, such as, for example, uh, zinc oxide that could be also designed using the SAS process. But now we stepped even further to see how we can use the whole concept of the swelling-based infiltration to create multi-component structure. And in this case, we've been thinking about that during the swelling step, in addition to just creating the small porosity inside the polar domains, we can dissolve additional precursors, metal oxide precursors in ethanol, the swelling engine that is used for the swelling, and use it also as a driving force to incorporate additional elements. So we started with the initial block of polymer, 
we exposed it to the swelling based infiltration step. So here we had our palladium oxide precursor being dissolved in ethanol. That allowed us to incorporate palladium inside polar domains. And afterwards, we expose it to the second step of the infiltration using aluminum. As a result, after removing the polymer templates, we are receiving more complex systems of multi-component structures. So here are the example of how we've been creating, depending on how much of palladium we are infiltrating inside our materials, we have less availability for the aluminum infiltration. And that is really important because it gives us the possibility for tuning the final composition of the system. Um, what happened that overall the structure really didn't change. You probably remember this from the previous slides that we had the evolution of the polymers during the steps of the swelling and the infiltration. But what happens inside our polymers is really affected by the resulting structure. And here is like really interesting summary of the discoveries that we observed. These materials, again, they were designed already, they were imaged after removing the polymer templates. As a result, we see that the temperature of the polymer uh, removal uh, process affecting the final structure. You can see in all the three cases when the different processing conditions were used. Here we just exposed our polymers with the infiltrated materials to UV, here to 450 and here to 600 degrees C. All three structures showing this similar composition. They're demonstrating the incorporation of uh, nanoscale particles, round shape palladium oxide nanoparticles in amorphous aluminum matrix. So you can see these darker spots like being palladium oxide and then a uh, grayish lighter uh, area matrix is alumina that we have surrounding. The infiltration is very uniform. We see this nice distribution of nanoparticles inside the structures. And this is like very consistent inside the materials. Depending on the conditions of the infiltration, we see we do see variation in the size of the nanoparticles, but this only happens upon the transitioning from UV regime to 450. With further processing, and we did, I'll show you in the next slides, we did up to 900 degrees C exposure of our materials, the size of the nanoparticles that we have now incorporated in the structure remains the same. So this is like really amazing because Currently, palladium oxide is the model system that is used for catalytic reactions, for catalysis uh, of the combustion uh, reactions. And using these combustion byproducts and using this approach, we can create very stable systems. While I currently use system, they really struggle to perform well upon cycling events as usually uh, palladium oxide just manually, mechanically mixed with the alumina. Here, by doing this infiltration and continuous steps, we really encapsulating our structures and not let them to degrade or like to start sintering, diffuse, and create large agglomerates on the, of the materials. So the TM analysis confirms formation of these crystalline palladium oxide nanoparticles uniformly distributed in amorphous aluminum matrix. And having amorphous aluminum matrix is also important because it allows easier accessibility of the palladium oxide to the uh, gases that we will be sensing in the following steps. And heating above 450 degrees C does not affect the structure of nanoparticles. So we have like very consistent formation of nanoparticles inside alumina. With this one, I'm coming to the uh, end of my talk and showing some of the exciting results that we've been observing for these systems. Uh, we looked at the catalytic activity of palladium oxide in alumina. And independently, if we have some pretreatment conditions, independently, if we have some 
temperature variations, if we have like exposure to the different uh, gas mixtures, they show very, very uniform stability. They show like very consistent behavior for CO oxidation, for methane conversion, that really demonstrates that using this concept, we not only creating this multi-component systems that have the now possibility for combining the elements together, but they also create creating very stable material configurations, which are usually not possible using the regular approaches for the design of the nanoporous materials. And uh, with this one, we've been able to load our materials up to 10 weight percent, which is like very, very high loading, usually not possible using the traditional approaches, and also demonstrating the access to all the available possible area. So we calculate that based on the loading, how much of the area we would create in palladium oxide. Now, due to having this palladium oxide being encapsulated in alumina matrix, in amorphous alumina, all of these palladium oxide surface was available for the combustion reaction. That was, convert, uh, that was confirmed in the uh, catalytic activity testing. And with this one, I'm kind of like trying to just summarize that we've been able to create this multi-component systems that are like really interesting and really uh, fascinating. They providing like lots of the of lots of the sensitivity to the surrounding gases, surrounding liquids, and they're showing very high catalytic activity in combustion reactions with methane and carbon monoxide gases. Um, I would like to thank you for your attention and acknowledge students who've been working in this direction. Again, this was like pretty new direction for me when I started at uh, UNT, but like now I recently got a career and sub-career award based on this work and making like more complex systems using this approach. So the whole uh, approach that we're working now that due to the compatibility of the process with low temperature materials and with like different geometries, we can actually also create some more complex systems. We can print the sensors, we can print these multi-component structures on any possible substrate using the 3D printer probe and just create the patterns. Then expose it to the precursors and replicate the printed pattern using the nanoporous ceramic sensors. And that offers us unlimited possibilities for incorporating the materials, combining them together and creating some new novel concepts. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Diana, for a very interesting talk. So if anyone have any question, please, uh... Uh, write it in Q&S section so that we can see. I did not see any question here. Let me see. Chat. So I have a quick question about the uh, making this interconnected complex structure with a different crystallinity mm -hmm. at the surface between two different matrix, for example, how you can control the crystallinity at the interface? So in this case, like for example, palladium oxide and alumina during the conversion and during the uh, pretty much infiltration, we are changing the uh, phases of the materials that we are creating. So for example, palladium oxide is more prone to forming the crystalline structure, while with alumina, 
uh, using the infiltration, we are able to create this amorphous matrix that stays at amorphous uh, amorphous uh, structure for like exposing even like to very high temperatures. So it really depends on the components that we are infiltrating, what exact materials we are inserting. But that is like really interesting question that because we'll also observe that the, like if I'll go back, also observe that exposure to the polymer process, polymer removal process affecting this crystallinity. So if we can do also the removal polymer template removal in several steps, we can play with the way how we crystallize the materials and how they start to agglomerate, segregate and form new phases. Thank you. Any more question if anyone have? Thank you very much, Dinah. So thank you for your interesting talk. Thank you. Then probably we will end this session here. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you.